It's a pleasure to add my welcome and an honor to meet all of you. I am thrilled to be a part of this dynamic conference. Thank you for this opportunity to connect and thank you for your dedication to helping this country's English learner students succeed. I was one of those students. My mom and I came from Cuba in search for a better life with a hope my dad would join us soon after. Spanish was the language we spoke at home, so I started my kindergarten year not knowing a word of English. It could have been very terrifying if it wasn't for my teacher, Mrs. Larkin, and her miracles. I use the word miracles because back in the 70s, there wasn't much research or resources to reach kids like me, but she did. I wonder if she knew that I would end up being an educator for almost 30 years now. I recently joined Lexia Learning in December of 2019, where I work as a senior advisor, or as I like to call it, a thought partner to the company and our customers on everything having to do with the English learner community. It's a community I have served my whole career. I got my start in Miami, where I taught English to speakers of other languages. Then in North Carolina, I directed the state's migrant education program for many years. Most recently, I had the honor of working as the Assistant Deputy Secretary and Director of the Office of English Language Acquisition at the United States Department of Education. In this role, I was responsible for the overall leadership, management, and direction of education for English language learners nationwide. I also oversaw the development and dissemination of discretionary grants, research studies, and resources that guide education practice and policy to meet the needs of our country's emergent bilingual students, our English learners. I have pulled from all of those experiences to set our agenda for this session. I will start us off by putting my federal cap back on. I have to say, the United States Department of Education's continued commitment to accountability with our English learners really hasn't wavered during the pandemic. The advocate in me is encouraged that there is still a heightened focus on English learner proficiency attainment during this challenging time. So for the first item on the agenda, we will review the ESEA requirements for English learners and what state and district responsibilities look like in our current situation, according to the United States Department of Education. That way, you'd be armed with answers to questions that many in the ELL community are asking in regards to their rights. Whether schools are functioning with in-person instruction, rely wholly on distance learning approaches, or use some hybrid of these, they must prioritize the needs of emergent bilingual students. I will share some district challenges currently being discussed by the top emergent bilingual experts nationally. There's a lot of talk on the digital divide, but we know that access alone will not solve the problem. We need tools and practices specifically designed for English learners. It's a challenging time, so for the third item on the agenda, we will highlight evidence-based solutions which support districts in these efforts. One of the solutions we will discuss involves creating an inclusive remote environment for students. So we will review how to ensure that English learners and their parents are fully engaged in learning. And finally, we don't know how long we will need to rely on remote learning. So I will share a four phase approach that provides a roadmap for creating longer term remote learning plans. This slide outlines some of our responsibilities to English learners and their parents during the move to remote learning due to the national emergency caused by COVID-19. It is intended to provide information about requirements in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, ESEA, and other federal laws related to English learners in light of COVID-19 and this specific situation. The secretary waived the requirement to administer an English language proficiency or ELP assessment this past school year. 
So a local education agency, an LEA, could use other resources to make instructional and placement decision for its English learners, like formative assessments and teacher input to help inform instruction and placement decisions. It's important to know that the Secretary has made it clear that for this coming school year, it is less likely that the U.S. Department of Education will grant assessment waivers again. If the LEA is operating via remote learning, the LEA must screen new students to determine L status to the extent possible. ESEA requires that students be identified for English learner status within 30 days of enrollment in a school. One example of a way to identify English learners remotely would be the LEA may be able to conduct a version of its screening assessment online or by telephone with interpreters as needed. What's important is that LEAs may need to adjust their standardized entrance procedures temporarily to identify English learner students as quickly as possible in order to start services for those students. An LEA must provide remote learning language instruction services to English learners. The department recognizes that physical school closures may affect how services are provided to English learners. The department understands that during this national emergency, schools may not be able to provide all services in the same manner they are typically provided. The department encourages parents, educators, and administrators to collaborate creatively to continue to meet the needs of English learners. Consider practices such as remote instruction, telephone calls, meetings held on digital platforms, online options for data tracking. In addition, an LEA might consider non-technology-based strategies such as providing instructional packets or assigning projects and written assignments to English learner students. The LEA is required to provide language accommodations for English learners for content classes that are held remotely to the greatest extent possible. An LEA may not exit an English learner from English learner status unless the student has demonstrated proficiency on a valid and reliable assessment that includes the four domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Due to the extended school closures caused by the COVID-19 national emergency, state education agencies, or SEAs, were able to adjust their statewide exit procedures for the 2019-2020 school year to eliminate any additional criteria between beyond the ELP assessment. So an LEA may want to consider this option if, for example, it used teacher input as an additional exit criterion. LEAs can try to complete that ELP testing in the fall of 2020 when possible, instead of administering the ELP assessment in spring 2021 on the state's usual schedule. SEAs and LEAs have an obligation to ensure meaningful communication with parents of English learners in a language they can understand and to adequately notify limited English proficient parents of information about any program, service, or activity. Taking all of that into account, whether schools have opened with in-person instruction, distance learning approaches, or some hybrid mix of these, they must prioritize the needs of English learner students, and many districts are doing just that. Because as you know, after COVID-19 with school closures and remote learning, we have essentially intensified the challenge of equitable access to resources. Over the past several months, Californians Together and English Learner Advocacy Organization asked hundreds of educators to provide details about their school's distance learning plans, focusing particularly on how they serve English learners. Let me ask you, according to Californians Together, what percentage of respondents do you think reported that most of their English learners were regularly participating in distance learning each week? I'll give you a minute to think about it. 
Just 17% of respondents reported that most of their English learners were regularly participating in distance learning each week. Only 17%. Could this be due to the fact that English learner families are marginalized by digital divides and reliable internet connectivity? Definitely. One thing is for sure, they need to be a priority. For Wi-Fi access, for example, many districts have distributed or set up mobile hotspots for students, supporting those families who may not have internet connection in the home. Another way they have addressed this is by contacting local or national internet providers about their discount programs, many of them are now offering. One organization in particular, Digital Bridge K-12, offers a step-by-step -step guide to help educators and administrators address the internet need of their students, helping them get connected at prices their families can afford. Lifeline is another resource. It's a federal program that lowers the monthly cost of phone and internet. Let me quickly share some other district challenges currently being discussed by top emergent bilingual experts throughout the nation. So besides equitable access to technology and internet, many of the language supports and resources that emergent bilingual students rely on in the classroom are not as accessible anymore, including those subtle ones like teacher gestures, word walls, and turning to a partner for clarification. Consistent face-to-face -face interactions are particularly critical for emergent bilingual students. Students learn more language when they engage in conversations with teachers and fellow students. Plus, live interaction builds relationships, advances social and emotional development, fosters student engagement, and grows student achievement. But now, there's limited access to live interactive instruction. Schools must resist any efforts to fast track emergent bilinguals progress by narrowing their academic experiences. Emergent bilingual students need access to the full curriculum at their schools, literacy, science, social studies, music, the arts, and more. If they have compelling, interesting school experiences, students will remain engaged and learn more. If they are force fed, daily remedial reading drills, they will be inactive. It has been difficult for districts to maintain a robust curriculum for our emergent bilingual students. For emergent bilinguals, the purpose of formative assessments is twofold, determining language development needs and identifying unfinished learning in content areas like reading, math, science, etc. I hear it all the time, even before COVID, Progress monitoring our emerging bilingual students is a big lift for districts. Teachers need to be supported with resources for a new era of teaching emergent bilingual students. Education leaders must acknowledge that teachers will need significant support and time to prepare. Administrators and teachers must collaborate and participate in professional development and find time to provide feedback on approaches that are and aren't working. But many districts are struggling to provide time and funding for professional development focused on supporting emergent bilinguals, linguistic and academic needs, particularly in online distance and or hybrid learning models. It's crucial to involve and communicate with families. The challenges I just mentioned would be more difficult if schools fails to communicate. Effective family communications are a necessary first step towards meaningful family engagement. Districts need to take this moment to look at their plans and virtual learning experiences through the eyes of emergent bilinguals and their families and make the best attempt to meet their learning needs. What are some ways to meet their needs? What are the best practices? First, it's important to note that teachers can refocus on what they know works when teaching emergent bilingual students and then reformat the lessons to adapt 
evidence-based practices to online environments, and then reimagine a system where all emergent bilingual students demonstrate success. In a time of dramatic shifts, educators can leverage what we already know about English learner students to support learning in new formats and address unfinished learning. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here are some of the talking points on the best practices currently being discussed right now by emergent bilingual experts nationwide. My parents are in town visiting and I told them they're crazy for coming up here from Florida all the way to DC during this crisis, but they were tired of quarantine and being alone. They desperately needed family time together. For many of our emergent bilinguals, the isolation and social distance is the most challenging part of this moment. We know that they learn best in and through relationships because they must be talking and actively producing language. Students need to practice new vocabulary and language structures in a variety of contexts, in informal ways as they talk with their peers about what they're learning, as well as in more formal ways as they engage in discourse with the teacher. We need to find digital learning resources that facilitate social interaction by providing a semblance of continuity and community and creating a space for connecting to get that opportunity to speak. According to the Association for Supervision and Curriculum, classroom teachers of low achieving students talk for what percentage of the time? Think about it for a bit before I give you the answer. Classroom talk is frequently limited and is used to check comprehension rather than develop thinking. Researchers have found that teachers dominate classroom talk. In classrooms with higher numbers of emergent bilinguals, teachers talk more and students talk less. We also know that they are, easier, they are asked easier questions or no questions at all and thus rarely have to speak in the classroom. ASCD reported that teachers of high achieving students spent about 55% of the class time talking compared with 80% for teachers of low achieving students. That needs to be flipped around. Ultimately, to learn a language, students have to speak it, and plenty of research supports this. Classrooms in which students talk more demonstrate greater learning, and students have been shown to be more engaged when they're participating in group discussions or actively presenting. Educators must prioritize live instruction and should consider even extra office hours to model language use. Language develops most powerfully when it is in the context of building knowledge about something and interacting with the world. Teachers need to provide the explicit development of academic language in ways that are connected to grade level content. In most programs, unfortunately, what emergent bilingual students usually get are random vocabulary lists which don't accelerate content mastery. So we need to be, um, we need to enable students to learn and practice new vocabulary and develop language through content area learning. For example, we can engage and motivate our students with activities that take them on a journey around the world. So look for programs with a robust curriculum and culturally responsive opportunities instead of force fed daily remedial reading drills. Keep the focus on academic learning and avoid providing only skill-based activities. When I taught ESOL in the 90s, we called those programs kill and drill. You know, when I was in kindergarten, my favorite part of the day was when Mrs. Larkin would send me to the reading center. She had one of those big record players with headphones. She also had a collection of several records that came with five books each. The record player would read to us and there was a bell that alerted us to turn the page. At first, I would focus on the illustrations, and eventually, I started to be able to point to the words, and in a couple of months, I was able to read books myself. My favorite book was the one on reptiles. When kindergarten was over, we moved to another school district during the summer, and I was terrified about my new predicament. I didn't speak English well, and I was in a new learning environment. 
Well, it was the first day of school and our new teacher, Mrs. Penn, greeted the class. Then she reached into a fish tank and pulled out the class pet. Its name was Stanley. She held it up and asked if anyone knew what it was. I immediately called out, it's a reptile. Then she asked what type of reptile it was and I said, chameleon. Mrs. Penn then asked if it was cold-blooded or warm-blooded, what did it eat, and so on. Needless to say, this little Latino boy had an answer for all of her questions, and the kids were looking at me in awe. My soon-to-be best friend Alvin told me, wow, you're the smartest kid in class. I was hoping that the next topic she'd ask about was going to be on baseball, which was my second favorite book in Mrs. Larkin's reading center. My point is I turned what I thought would be a crisis into an opportunity because I had been learning English through content. I was basically a little bilingual scientist. As I mentioned before, to keep emergent bilingual students engaged and excited about learning English, a high level of rigor must be maintained and topics should be compelling and interesting. Teachers should use scaffolding strategically to support emergent bilingual students in working with complex texts and concepts, but they need to do that without removing the productive struggle needed to build intellectual capacity. Emergent bilingual students need the productive struggle to be engaged. Another way of engaging students is providing them with a program that has student autonomy. So, the student dashboards, for example, should allow for some student choice in what they are tackling. For emergent bilinguals, this provides a bridge for them to mitigate disruptions in learning, which they will likely face during the school year. They can take greater risks and persist on activities when they fail, and they do this in a safe, private, non-judgmental environment. It frees them up to make mistakes, gain skills, and increase confidence. So rigor and autonomy leads to engagement. English learner educators offer tailored and personalized support for their students, something that is not available in many of the online programs. So look for digital learning resources that continuously adjust learning paths and propels the reading success of emergent bilingual students through scaffolded support and sophisticated branching. That's what the experts are asking for. Tailored support leads to acceleration. For emergent bilingual students to achieve their learning goals and close the gap quickly, it is critical to keep the standards in place and then adjust the instructional strategies to help the students meet their goals. In other words, digital learning resources should identify areas of need and then modify instructional intensity to ensure progress toward and achievement of standards. Emergent bilingual students benefit from scaffolded instruction, like this example of multiple meaning words. For me, multiple meaning words were a challenge. I mentioned that my second favorite book in kindergarten was on baseball, and I knew what a glove was and what a bat was and, and so on. But when Halloween rolled around and Mrs. Larkin hung bats from the ceiling, I was confused. But she provided explicit instruction on a discrete skill. Digital learning resources need to do the same, and that will give emergent bilinguals the opportunity to stop the COVID slide. I'm sure you're familiar with the summer slide. When students spend significant time out of school over the summer months, it results in what we call the summer slide. Researchers estimate that students lose on average the equivalent of one to three months of achievement gains over the summer. Further research has found that our population of emergent bilingual students experience greater summer learning loss than their peers. And now the coronavirus pandemic threatens to compound those losses. We call it the COVID-19 slide. This graph shows the estimated projections of the average academic growth trajectory by grade for reading. The research used the typical average growth trajectory for students who completed a standard length school year as a baseline to project two scenarios they call COVID-19 slowdown and COVID slide. 
Here is the key to the data points enlarged. In a typical year without a shutdown, shown as the solid lines on this graph, and I mark these with a green arrow, average academic growth varies across the school year. The dashed lines show projected trajectories under a COVID slowdown. I highlighted those with a blue arrow. In this scenario, with the dashed lines, students maintain the same level of academic achievement that they did when the schools were closed, and this was modeled for simplicity as a closure date of March 15th. Finally, and I think the most telling are the dotted lines. I placed a purple arrow on the dotted line. The dotted lines represent the COVID slide in which students showed patterns of academic setbacks typical of a summer throughout an extended closure. In other words, the researchers walked back the same slope we see in actual data during summer months to mid-March. So really resetting the end of school clock, if you will. The dotted lines or, or COVID slide forecast suggests students have returned in the fall with about 70% of the learning gains relative to a typical year. When thinking about assessment capabilities, an embedded assessment tool can be particularly helpful after the effects of the COVID-19 slide. And as I mentioned before, everyone I have spoken to in the ELL community has identified progress monitoring as their top concern. So look for programs that predict end of year performance, prescribe instructional intensity, and identify skill gaps and overall risk on an ongoing basis. You shouldn't have to wait for the annual proficiency assessment to know how your English learners are performing. Capabilities like these are crucial as districts deal with the COVID slide and as they reset for the year. Quick and reliable data is an important step for closing the gap for our emergent bilingual students. Strong relationships between home and school are a cornerstone of powerful education. As educators, we are relationship builders, forging connections with families, integrating students' strengths and interests into the curriculum, and creating a positive learning community. We need to find ways to celebrate students and let students share their successes. It's important during these challenging times to develop trusting relationships with families and support students' social-emotional learning needs. School-to-home communication like achievement certificates are important. For example, celebrating student milestones is an integral piece of motivating and engaging emergent bilingual students. And right now, they need this the most. We need to celebrate their accomplishments and give them the opportunity for can-do statements, which will keep them engaged in their learning. Here's a summary of the research-based practices I just shared that are being talked about by all the experts during this time in emergent bilingual education. Remember, we can make instruction comprehensible for emergent bilingual students by allowing them to participate in structured academic literacy, maximize their engagement, having them take part in high-level academic work, and positively reflect their experiences and cultures in the curriculum. So please take these ideas with you and use them when deciding on digital learning resources as you expand access to meaningful learning for emergent bilingual students through technology. I did want to emphasize separately the last bullet, creating inclusive classrooms. Here are six ways that educators can ensure they're creating an inclusive remote environment for all students, especially our emergent bilinguals, our English learners. First, as discussed, it's important to set students and families up with the right tools. Used both in the classroom and at home, educational technology has been shown to be beneficial for language learning, especially the use of speech recognition to provide practice and pronunciation feedback 
in a safe, non-judgmental space. While choosing an intuitive, easy-to-use program is preferable during this period of remote learning, online tech training sessions led by educators are crucial to help parents familiarize themselves with technology in order to better support their students. I heard a comedian the other day talk about how he was trying to help his elderly father set up his computer. He told him, Dad, first we need to open up a window. So the dad got up from his seat and opened the window in the room. It's funny, but for many of our families, they'll need basic training and support to go along with the devices. We've also discussed this before, how absolutely vital it is to work with emergent bilinguals, parents, or caregivers. During this period of remote learning, it's especially important for educators to find out what emergent bilingual parents and caregivers expect and need from them. One way to do this is to ask parents to share their hopes for their student. Teaching remotely makes it more challenging for educators to get to know their students and as quickly. So parents should also be encouraged to share details about their children's personality, interests, and strengths. This can provide useful insights about the family. It can also be beneficial to set up regular check-ins with parents and caregivers and to make sure communication is easier with translation services if needed. Now that many students are engaged in, in, in school from home, it's, it's important to focus on the resources that are available to them versus the ones that aren't. Parents and caregivers are a resource that educators can build on. Educators can provide suggestions for parents regarding how to support their emergent bilinguals oral language development through daily activities at home. This includes informal offline lessons, such as asking the student to tell a story using all of their languages, uh, sharing family stories, including the student in household chores like cooking and following a recipe, reading together in both languages, turning the captions on when watching TV, and so on. The other day I was a little curious because my three-year-old, Joey, was with my dad and he was listening to him intently as my dad was showing him something on his phone. Now, my dad still has a pretty heavy Cuban accent, so it's always fun to hear the two of them talk to each other. Anyway, I asked my son, what were you talking to Abuelo about? And Joey said, his peacock. And I tried to clarify, did you say your Abuelo has a peacock? And he said, yes, his peacock. And I began to wonder, what exactly is a peacock? And why does my dad need one? So my son ran to his grandfather and asked him for his phone, then came over to me and showed me the picture of my dad's pickup. <laughs> pickup. I celebrated my dad's attempt at English, but I told him to teach Joey the word camioneta to use these opportunities. And I reminded him that being bilingual is Joey's right, and we can view this as an opportunity to grow is bilingualism. It's an opportunity that all our students deserve, regardless of background or circumstance. And I know that's the goal everyone in this session is working for. Why is that? Well, we, we know that there's a lifelong learning benefit. Studies suggest there are cognitive, social, emotional, and academic benefits for children who grow up bilingual and biliterate. We need to get this message to our parents as well. Like I mentioned before, Provide activity ideas that leverage items already in the home, like categorize food in cabinets or act out how-to videos using first, next, and last. There are lots of activities ideas that allow students to do something not on the screen, but that keeps them on a journey to bilingualism. Cultural responsiveness or the ability to learn from and relate respectfully with people of your culture and others is an essential component of today's classroom. 
As part of culturally responsive education, teachers recognize emergent bilinguals' valuable cultural experiences and find ways to incorporate them in classroom activities. To create a more culturally responsive remote classroom, Teachers must consider instructional techniques, materials, online and off, their relationships with their students, and their own self-awareness, and can start with something as simple as pronouncing students' names correctly. Everyone calls me Jose, but I'm really Jose. Or understanding accent varieties. English is an international language used all over the world. Accents are expected. The focus should be on grammatically correct phrasing instead, providing opportunities for all students to think critically about inequities in their own classmates' experience is key too. Teachers can also consider the more recent introduction of culturally sustaining pedagogy, an approach that helps students develop a positive cultural identity while learning academic subjects such as math, reading, problem solving, and civics. Now, a distinction must be made between culturally responsive pedagogy and multicultural education. Education that is multicultural can be delivered to a classroom containing students from the same culture. The content presented is representative of various cultural perspectives. Culturally responsive pedagogy, on the other hand, must respond to the cultures actually present in the classroom. It connects new information to students' background knowledge and presents the information in ways that respond to students' natural ways of learning. Multicultural education may be a heading under which culturally responsive pedagogy exists. Culturally responsive pedagogy is one means to the ultimate objective of multicultural education for all. If you notice, at times I refer to our English learners as emergent bilinguals, and my first goal when I was at the U.S. Department of Education was to surface our marginalized students' unique strengths and talents. You may have heard people refer to English learners and say things like, they know so little. What this means, of course, is their language proficiency in English. What this does is diminish the background knowledge that the learner does have and that they bring to us. It also implies that the teaching is going to be a challenge rather than a joyous and exciting event because this really is an opportunity to help someone learn English and thus become bilingual. Think about how the deficit model permeates every action that we take at the school level. The deficit model thinking requires us to give students a home language survey and if the parents say that they speak anything other than English at home, the student is flagged. Now, what are they flagged for? Are they flagged for being bilingual? No, they're flagged for not knowing English. The immediate assumption is that if any other language is spoken at home, the learner automatically doesn't know English, so the learner will be tested for their English uh, knowledge. Our goal here is to help change our mindset and instead treasure the learner for their superpower. It's a superpower they bring to the classroom, and it's, that's, it's better than labeling them for, for, for what they lack. If we approach our current systems from an asset model mindset, then our current systems will change. We can see this is already happening, and we encourage it to happen more. This asset-based approach counters the more popular deficit-oriented teaching methods and helps ensure students see themselves and their communities reflected and valued in the content they're being taught in school. By focusing on what emergent bilinguals bring to the classroom, teachers can help improve emergent bilingual achievement and discourage them from being disengaged. As we mentioned before, opportunities for speaking practice are critical. Without the in-person classroom experience to encourage speaking, educators will have to rely on educational technology, which has proven to be beneficial for language learning. Programs that incorporate speech recognition technology can provide opportunities for practice and pronunciation feedback in a safe, non-judgmental space while students are at home. 
remote small group meetings organized by level in addition to one-on-one -on -one live sessions can also help educators facilitate speaking practice for these students. And don't forget, on their journey to bilingualism, they need to practice their home language, even if it's not high-level academic language. It's okay to speak a little bit of Spanglish. It's okay to use translanguaging. One thing I like to stress about remote learning is that no matter what your plan is, it's not set in stone. I refer to it as a process, not an event. Any remote learning plan your school or district has implemented will have to be continuously monitored and improved upon, particularly as it relates to student engagement. When developing and monitoring a long-term remote learning plan, Although the instinct may be to throw out the playbook and start fresh, it's more important than ever to rely on proven frameworks and instructional strategies. One of my colleagues came up with a four-phase approach that provides a roadmap for creating longer-term remote learning plans, outlining established traits and frameworks that have prepared schools and districts for this moment. The relationships built with communities the teachers empowered to step up and become instructional leaders, the multi-tiered systems of support frameworks in place, and effective online blended programs are all fundamental aspects of scalable and sustainable plans. The first phase, continue, emphasizes the importance of continuity of instruction even while school is fully remote. The second phase, ADAPT, acknowledges that adaptations will be needed in order for instruction to continue in a distance learning environment. The third phase, PRESERVE, underscores that instructional standards can be perpetuated and high level of learning can continue with proven online learning solutions. And finally, MONITOR highlights the necessity of using data to inform decision-making and gauge progress towards goal. Together, these four phases are essential to create and maintain a scalable and sustainable remote learning plan. All right, we covered a lot of ground, so I'll quickly sum up everything we've talked about today. All schools and districts are currently incorporating some form of remote learning this year. Relying on proven frameworks and our four-phase approach can help schools and districts develop longer-term remote learning programs uh, going forward. Remote learning equity must be prioritized as schools and districts face many challenges, particularly with regard to emergent bilingual students. Key responsibilities and areas of concern include digital access, parent and family engagement, speaking practice, tailored support, and progress monitoring. Creating an inclusive remote learning environment is absolutely essential, and the right tools, culturally responsive pedagogies, parent involvement, and opportunities for speaking practice can help. So, Thank you for hearing me out. I am passionate about our emergent bilingual students, but I am just as passionate when it comes to advocating for access to meaningful technology, especially during this time. Thanks again for all you do. I know you are all working so hard every day to keep the learning going. We at Lexia Learning are proud to stand with you and support your work. So please fee feel free to contact me with any questions, comments, or concerns. My phone number is 1-800-435-3942. My extension is 6316. Or you can reach me uh, by email at jviana at lexialearning.com. Love to hear from you uh, and uh, have a, a wonderful uh, conference.